Well, I want to add my happy Mother's Day to all of you moms here at the Lynn Haven campus. If you're watching online, if you're in Norfolk, happy Mother's Day. We hope that you are celebrated well today. Uh, and uh, sorry, sorry about the weather, you know, if you wanted to go to the beach, mom, sorry. But uh, hopefully there'll be something indoors that you can do that will be good for you. Uh, but we love you, and I am excited uh, to, to share with you a message today all about women. It's going to be great. I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, and today, uh, I do go on sabbatical this afternoon. So if you have been thinking or praying about that, uh, thank you for your support and for your encouragement. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to gracebible.church. There's a little video you can watch there. But I will uh, be back in August. And uh, you, you, you probably just won't see me for the next three months. But don't worry, I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in, in the universe somewhere and uh, looking forward to, to this time away and then to be back strong in August. So... We are in this sermon series, Allowed to Ask, for the last couple of weeks, and we talked about uh, why racial unity was so important to Grace Bible Church. That was the first week. Uh, last week, we talked about what's the deal with the church and gay people. Uh, if you missed last week, you might want to check that one out. Uh, and then today, I want to talk about, is the Bible good news for women? I want to I answer that question together, and I, I want to begin by putting a date on the screen here. August 18th, 1920. Uh, now I'd love you don't you don't, don't Google it you know quite yet but I would love for you to just think for a second do you know what happened on August 18th 1920 some of you do uh, some of you don't it's a big day August 18th 1920 I'm not asking you to, to say it out loud but I will tell you this is the day that the 19th Amendment was passed and women got the right to vote. Women couldn't vote until you could clap for that I guess I don't know I don't know if I clap for that or if I'm like what. I, when, I, when I learned this a few years ago, and I'm sure I learned it in school, but it didn't mean anything to me. But when I felt the weight of this, I mean, that was just over 100 years ago that women had the right to vote. What in the world? That blows my mind. And here's what I want us to see today as we think about that reality that our country existed for all of this time before women can vote. And that is... While, while men and women all have challenges, there are unique challenges to being a woman. There, there, just, there just are. And I feel like that date captures the reality that there are unique challenges to being a woman. And I want you to know today that the Bible speaks to this. And, and here is my heart. My heart is that we will be able to go beyond sentiment and what seems like it should be to really be able to put a stake in the ground to know why we can answer this question in the affirmative. Is the Bible good news for women? Yes. Why? Because the Bible is for women. We're for the 757. Well, the Bible is for women. So if you are a woman today, whether you're a mom or not, uh, this, this sermon should just leave you flying high, I hope. You will feel so encouraged. And if you're a, a man watching this, I hope you will just feel more inspired to love and honor and serve the women in your life. So while we've had two like moderately controversial sermons, I'm excited to end my sabbatical by just celebrating women. Uh, so I'm like, oh, this is an easy one. One, right after the last couple of weeks. Okay, I'm going to give you today three specific reasons. And please, when I get to something like, oh yeah, I already know that, just stay with me. Let this sink deep into you, whether you're a man or a woman. Three reasons today. Number one, why is the Bible good news for women? Because creation was not complete without women. Creation was not complete without women. Women. So we go back to Genesis. We go back to Genesis 1, to the beginning of the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and we see in the creation account, I just want you to, you know, I'll do it for you, but you can play with me, right? There are all these pairs, right? The heavens and the earth, right? Light and dark, day and night, land and sea, sun and moon, fish and birds, male and Male and female, not an extra, not an add-on, not a, oh, I have an extra bonus idea. This isn't, you know, the extended scene after the credit. This isn't the cut scene. This is not women. This is, women. This is essential to creation. Feel that in your bones, ladies and gentlemen. And I know you're like, Eric, why do you keep coming back to these texts? Because these are the texts that we can mine for depth for the rest of our lives. We will never plumb the depths of the story of creation and the implications for our world today. So back to Genesis 1.21. Here we go. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We can never allow anyone to question whether or not men and women were equally created in the image of God. And here's the thing. You have to root that somewhere. You have to root that somewhere. Genesis. Genesis 1, the creation account. Look at verse 28. And God blessed man, no, and God blessed them. God blessed them and said to them, and he goes on and on and on in the story, right? And when we look at the account of creation, we look at Genesis 1, here's what we see. We see male and female together with God. That in the beginning, men and women together with God. God. You have to feel this. Now, the way we talk about this and the way I'd love for to just help you think biblically and think worldview are these four circles that we've looked at before. If you're like, Eric, what's the deal with the four circles? The deal with the four circles is almost all of the questions that you have about faith, almost all of the questions that your friends have about faith, their answers are rooted in the big story of what God has done and what God is doing. It's not ancillary or just taken for granted that we were designed for good. And what is designed for good? Male and female, together with God, together with God. And the reason we have to lock on to what God was doing in creation, the reason I want you to just root it in your heart is what comes next, damaged by evil, Because if we forget that God created good, male, female, together with God, image of God, equal pairing, if we forget this, then when we are damaged by evil, we will allow this to define the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about the world, and that will lead us all sorts of confusing places because sin has damaged everything. We are damaged by evil because of our sin and the sin around us. And so we've gotta keep going back to, oh, that's right, here's what we were designed for. And I know this might seem odd, but the second piece of good news I have for you, and the second reason the Bible is good news for women is this, number two, sin demeans women as image bearers. Like, well, that seems like an odd piece of good news. Really, that's good news that sin demeans women as image bearers? Yes, this is good news for you in the story. And here's why it is good news. Because it tells you that you should not be treated this way. The fact that sin demeans women as image bearers is good news because when it happens to you, you can say this should not be. That's why the justice of God is so important. That's why the righteousness of God is so important. That's why God's intent is so important because it helps us to see what should be and what shouldn't be. So as you see women demeaned or taken advantage of, right, you have something to point to. Let's just go back to it. Let me ask you this question. Are men and women equally created in God's image? Again, just think think about this answer to yourself. Are men and women equally created in God's image? This is a Yes or no question. Okay, now, the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. We already, <laughs> hopefully you're with me thus far, right? That was, that was number one. Okay, now, now, you ready? Why? Just think to yourself. You're in a conversation, you're in a debate, you're seeing something happening in the world. Are men and women equally created in God's image? Why? And here's what I want to say to you. Do not say, obviously. Are women, men and women created equally in God's image? Obviously. It is not obvious to everyone. This is so important. And and it's, I would say it's our tendency. I think it's the tendency of the human heart. Maybe we just feel it more in our country, or maybe we feel it more because we have more access to the rest of the world. But it is tempting if someone asks you, are men and women created in God's image? It's tempting to think, well, duh, Duh, of course they are. Obviously they are. It is not obvious to everyone. Let's just just go with me for a second. If you were to visit all of the different peoples and all of the different nations in the world, you would visit 
communities inhabited by billions of people on planet Earth right now who do not value men and women equally. Billions of people do not, right? Remember, remember when we withdrew from Afghanistan about, about a year ago? Who were we worried about when we withdrew? We were worried about women. We were worried about, we were worried about women, right? I don't know if you've been to Southeast Asia at all. I've been a couple times. You go to most of Southeast Asia, a lot of Asia in general. Women are not valued. Daughters are not valued. Baby girls are not valued like sons. So please do not say it's obvious. Well then, why in the world do we get to impose our culture on their culture? Why in the world do you think that you can go to some billions of people across the world and say to them that they should value women equally with men? Who are you to say that? Why do we get to say that it's right? Why can't we do a Mother's Day sermon that says, hey, women, we're willing to appreciate you sort of maybe if we're feeling nice. Why, would, why is that wrong? Listen, that's why I had to do point one. The reason is not because it's obvious. The reason is not because of our constitution. The, not, the reason is not because of the 19th Amendment. The reason is not because women are so great. The reason is in the scriptures that Jesus affirmed, Jesus affirmed Genesis, and God said in the beginning, male and female created in the image of God. You have to have a why. You have to have a why because if you, you have to have a why because sin will demean women by denying their equal worth. That's what sin does. So when sin, whether it's on a, like a national people group, billions of people level, or whether it's in your own home, someone is denying a woman her equal worth, you have to have a reason to fight against this sin. And the reason is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created male and female in his image. You are image bearers, lady, ladies, though sin wants to demean you by denying your equal worth. But sin is tricky. It's, it's, it's demeaning all of your image bearerness. So part of being an image bearer is you're created equal. Here's another way it demeans you as an image bearer. Sin demeans women by objectifying their bodies. That's sin doing that. And when women are treated as objects, when women are objectified because of their bodies, it is demeaning the image of God in them. Again, we, we gotta get to this, right? Why is pornography so damning to our world? It objectifies people created in the image of God. Why is sex trafficking so horrible? It is demeaning people created in the image of God. It is objectifying women. It is taking this precious, beautiful person, image bearer of God, made to be treasured, and treating her as an object. It should not be. Why? Because it's wrong? Not just because it's wrong, because she's an image bearer. Now, this is like hardwired into us if we can get into it deep enough because we're all created in God's image, and, right? Like here, here's one of the ways we, most of us, the vast majority of people can see this, right? Why is it that almost no one, I don't know of anyone, maybe it's happening somewhere, but let's just say almost no one, right, is watching a sexually explicit scene in a movie or certainly not pornography, involving their sister. Nobody wants to see their sister naked, having sex with somebody else. Like, like, like literally your sister. Think about your little sister, your older sister. Do you want to see her naked on a screen? No, of course you don't. Because there is a relationship with that woman. You, it's harder to objectify people you are close to. Well, what does the scripture call the church to do? The scripture calls the church to see all of us as brothers and sisters in the family of God. Helps us to see the image of God in one another. 
It's why we need to pray against the sexual exploitation of women, whether it's to sell hamburgers or cars or clothes or whatever. It's why if you are struggling with pornography, whether you're a man or a woman, we want to come alongside you at Celebrate Recovery. Come tomorrow night, come Tuesday night. You will find a place that can lead you into freedom for your sake, but also because women should not be objectified. But it gets even more insidious. Sin also idolizes the female body, which leads to self-condemnation for women. You get it from both sides, ladies. On the one hand, you are objectified by others. On the other side, your bodies are idolized, which makes a standard that you can never live up to, and now you are condemned. Sin is insidious, demeaning the image of God in you, right? So I'm treated like an object, or bodies are worshipped. And the idolizing, perfection, you know, fantasy woman causes you then, ladies, to condemn the very body that God has given you. And he has created all of our bodies and all of our shapes and sizes. And your body is never the source of your worth. It's never the source of your worth. Now, everything in our culture will tell you that it is. Everything in our culture will tell you that you're worth more if you hit this standard, you're worth less if you hit that one. That's why we go back to the image of God. I want to encourage you. I want to say to you, don't let yourself demean yourself. When you are tempted to find your worth in your body, pause Thank God for the body he's given you. It is miraculous. All of our bodies are miraculous and and it's a part of you being created in the image of God. Sin wants to get at you all these ways. So how are you gonna fight against that? You're gonna remember Genesis 1. You say, in the beginning, God created. He created a male and female in his image. He created them. Don't condemn yourself because of some fantasy that someone else has created. Third way, third way. Creation, not complete without a woman. Sin demeans women as image bearers. Third one, one I'm actually most excited about because I think it's the one we are least aware of. Third, women point to the reality of the church and the hope of new creation. Okay, now, I want to tell you, if you are new to, you're coming back to church, you're less familiar with the story, stay with me, hang on, you know, it's it's, it's sort of going like to 2 and 301, uh, but I want you to see the continuity of what God has been doing over time, okay? Women point to the reality of the church, the gathered church, we get that, and the new creation like the end of time. So let me do this, and uh, and hopefully it it will encourage you, maybe we'll learn something together. Okay, next question. Why does it matter that men and women are different? Why does it matter that men and women are different? Now, again, this is an important question to answer. Why does it matter that men and women are different? This is a question that, that fortunately, uh, has, has some really good answers if we're willing to look at the grand story that we find ourselves in. There are a lot of questions that we bring to God, a lot of questions we bring to the text that are sort of why questions that we do not get an answer to. There there are plenty of why questions we do not get an answer to. But there is a very specific answer to why male and female are so important. Now, I do want to acknowledge, I do want to acknowledge that we are going to find that importance in the picture of marriage. And the reason I want to acknowledge that is that marriage uh, for some is a great delight, but for others is a place of pain either because you're in a marriage that is especially difficult or because you long to be married and you're not. And I wanna say that if you find yourselves in either of those difficult categories, stay with me, because at the end, I got really surprisingly good news for you. Okay, surprisingly good news for you. Just wanna acknowledge the pain, but also the good news. So, okay, why does it matter, male and female? Here we go. Genesis 2, complementary account of creation. We read, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So God puts Adam to sleep. He wakes up. There's a naked woman there. And he's like, yes, she's with me. I'm with her. Boom. It's like, that's the story in Hebrew. Wow. That's, that's the like, literal meaning there. Okay, verse 24. That is why, we talked about this last week. That is why, male and female, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Okay, I did a, a wedding last night, uh, talked about this passage at the wedding. We get all of this. Now, pause, Genesis. We're gonna go forward thousands of years to the New Testament time. And in the New Testament, you can do, you can do, this, you can do this for yourself. There are plenty of free stuff on Google that you can do this. In the New Testament, these are frequently quoted passages. Jesus, we looked at it last week, Jesus quotes from Genesis. The apostle Paul, who planted most of the churches in the ancient Near East, the apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 also quotes from Genesis. And what we see here, what we see here is that God was doing something in Genesis that is being revealed to us in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and the way it quotes from Genesis 2. Okay, here we are, Ephesians 5, 31. Paul's quoting Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and he will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You get it? So Ephesians 5, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's instructing them about how husbands and wives should live together, and he's drawing on what happened in Genesis. And now, next, in the next verse, he is going to take male and female in marriage and explode it. Give it new meaning, explode it to a depth and a power and an insight that no one had had before. It was in the mind of God in the beginning, but not revealed until Jesus. That's what's so powerful about Jesus. He fulfilled all of these things that God had been doing for centuries. Look at verse 32. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. When you think about marriage, male and female, the reason it matters is that women, you image in your bodies the entire church of Jesus Christ. That you are a picture of what God had been doing and planned to do from the foundation of the world to redeem his people in Jesus. And this mystery is that marriage isn't just about two people having a really expensive party. It's a mystery about Christ and the church. And ladies, you image the whole church. All of us are imaged in you in marriage. And it's so important because it's not just for now. And this is where I said, I know, stay with me if you're less familiar with the Bible. But at the very end of the New Testament, the very end of the Bible, the last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation can be mysterious and confusing. We've talked about that before. But at the very, very end, it describes for us how Jesus will return for the church. And ladies, I want you to see yourselves in Revelation. So Revelation 19, here, look at this verse. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. So there's this great crying out about God and how grand he is and he reigns and King Jesus is coming again. Verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb. Jesus is the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It is no accident that in every culture in the world, there is a bride in a wedding ceremony that has her way of making herself beautiful for her groom. And ladies, that desire in you is a reflection of the image of God in you and in human marriage is mirroring what will come one day when the bride, the church, is finally redeemed by the lamb and new creation happens. Women, you are a picture of that. Your wedding day is more than your wedding day. 
Your desire to be beautiful on your wedding day is more than a desire to be beautiful. It is the image of God in you exploding into creation, pointing to the end, pointing to the time when Jesus returns. He makes all things right. Look at verse eight. It says, fine linen, made herself clean. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. The beauty of the bride, the preparation, the planning. Ladies, you're a picture of the entire church who's been redeemed by Jesus and one day will come together. The groom will return for his bride. Look at uh, Revelation 21. We'll skip forward a little bit. John continues to write, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Remember, that's where we're going. The church and the new heavens and the new earth. When Jesus returns, we don't all go to heaven. The end is not heaven. The end is not heaven. We just need to say that together. The end is not heaven. One day, will I be in heaven? The end is not heaven. What is the end? New heavens and a new earth. Fun, creation, food, drink, sports, all the good stuff for eternity. New earth, that's where we're going. New creation, new creation. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. This is where we live now. The sea represents chaos. There's no more chaos. There's no more disorder. New heaven and new earth, verse two. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, represents the church, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. This is in us. At the end, at the end, when Jesus returns, we, the church, represented by the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Now, sis, I, want you, I want you to see this Revelation 19 too. You can go back to it. Okay. At the end, Jesus the groom will return for his bride, the church, who has prepared herself, who is beautiful, who's put on a beautiful dress and is ready to receive her husband. And look at this. At the end, Every longing that every person on planet earth has in their human marriages. Get this. Every longing that you have in your human marriage or for a human marriage will be fulfilled when Jesus returns for the church. Jesus makes it clear in his teaching that in the new creation, marriage as we know it will be no more. Well, why is that? Because our marriages now are a picture of the ultimate marriage between Christ and the church. If you long to be married and you are not, I want you to hear me say today, one day that longing will be fulfilled when Jesus the, groom's return, when Jesus the groom returns for his bride. The pain that you feel in your marriage, the unfulfilled longings, hopes, dreams, desires, expectations in your marriage will one day be fulfilled because the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. When Jesus returns, he returns for the church. The church is imaged here and now by women, by beautiful women, by women who are image bearers, by women in whom, in your whole essence, you declare to the world the grand story that Jesus loves his bride. That's what you do, women. It's what he's created you to do. Verse three, and we'll move towards wrapping up. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. At the end of time, when Jesus returns for his bride, and the church and Jesus are reunited. What does he do in the new creation? What is the picture of the new creation? And he will dwell with them. 
when else was God dwelling with his people in unhindered, beautiful relationship? When else was this happening? Do you remember a minute ago? At the beginning, that's right, we go back to the graphic. This is why we added new creation a couple of weeks ago. We were designed for good, damaged by evil. Jesus came, he sends us on a mission, but one day the new creation will come and we will be together with God. But forever, instead of being together male and female, ladies, you represent all of us and Jesus the groom comes, why? To ultimately redeem us. That what he accomplished on the cross will be fulfilled in the new creation. Yes, he accomplished it here, but we still have all of the sin, pain, disease, all that, and one day in the new creation, it will all be fulfilled. And so, when you're talking with your daughters about how beautiful they are and how important they are and how strong and courageous and smart and brave and all of those things, don't take it for granted that that's just what everyone believes. Let them know that their heavenly father created them in God's image. Let them know that everything that battles against them is, against them is sin trying to bring them down. And let them know that they are a picture. They are a picture that one day Jesus will come and redeem the church in his name and every longing and hope and desire will be fulfilled. It's that good a story. It's really good news for women. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And I pray that every single one of us, deep in our hearts, would have a renewed sense of honoring the women in our lives, created in your image to represent your church for all time. And I pray against every spirit that would demean or objectify or condemn women for anything, emotionally, physically, in their relationships, in their bodies. We pray against the sin that seeks to demean women, and I pray for the women in our midst to know that their value and their worth is eternally secure, created in the image of of God. And would you allow us and give us the grace to carry this good news with us into a world that so desperately needs to know that our worth is found in you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.